Today, we are going to look at the lorises. These fascinating primates are small nocturnal mammals that live in the tropical forests of Southeast Asia, but many of them are unfortunately highly endangered due to deforestation, the pet trade, and their use in traditional medicines. For those interested, there is a document in the description with notable research papers I used for this video, along with the details of the sources for the images used. Lorises are in the order primates. They are one of the earliest divergences in the order, being one of the least related to the primates that you are likely thinking of. Going through a simplified phylogeny of the order, you start with the superfamily Lorisoidea, which contains the lorises we will be looking at today, as well as the galagos. Their closest relative is the lemurs in the superfamily Lemuroidea. These long-tailed primates have around 100 species, but are only found in Madagascar. One interesting similarity between lemurs and lorises is that they are the only primates with wet noses, similar to a cat or a dog. All other primates are dry-nosed, like a human. The next superfamily is less closely related, but it is the Tarsias in Tarsioidea. Tarsias are long-fingered, large-eyed, arboreal primates only found in the islands of Southeast Asia. Together, Tarsias, lemurs, and lorises are sometimes called the prosimians, due to their shared characteristics that are more primitive than the other primates, which are called the simians. Prosimian is a group known as a grade, instead of being a clade. The difference is that a clade is phylogenetic, so must contain all descendants of their most recent common ancestor. A grade, however, is a term used to group animals based on their appearance. They use morphology instead of phylogenetics. So prosimian is a grade, as to be a clade it would have to include all monkeys and apes too, since the most recent common ancestor of lorises and tarsias is the same one that all of the other primates are also descended from. The lemurs, lorises and galagos do form their own clade though, as they share a more common recent ancestor with each other than they do with any other primate. The first two groups of simians are the two lineages of monkeys. The first one is the Parvorda platyrrhini, or the New World monkeys. These are the monkeys found in the Americas, like spider monkeys, capuchins, owl monkeys, marmosets, and tamarins. The next clade is the Old World monkeys in the superfamily Cercopithecoidea. These are found in Africa and Asia, and include things like baboons, macaques, vervet monkeys, and mandrills. The next family is Hylobatidae, or the gibbons. These large primates live in the tropical forests of Bangladesh, India, China, and Indonesia. They are sometimes called the lesser apes, and are known to use a unique method of swinging through trees called brachiation, where they only use their arms to move from branch to branch. Some other primates use a modified version of this, such as the spider monkeys who also use their tail as a fifth limb, but gibbons are the only group that use true brachiation. The last family of primates is Hominidae, which contains the great apes, orangutans, gorillas, bonobos, chimpanzees, and humans. You are likely somewhat familiar with this group, but they are known for their intelligence, use of tools, and larger size than other primates. While the phylogeny of primates is extremely interesting, it is time to return to the subject of today's video. Lorisoidea has two families in it, Galigidae, or the Galagos, and Lorisidae, or the Lorises. Galagos, sometimes called bush babies or nagapes, are small nocturnal primates found in sub-Saharan Africa. There are six living genera of Galagos, with about 20 species between them. Larissidae is comprised of two subfamilies. Pyrodictisinae has two genera in it, containing the two species of Anguantibo and the three species of Poto. These are all found in Africa, and are distinctive due to their vestigial tail and very short index finger, allowing them to grip onto branches more firmly. Their large eyes give them stereoscopic vision, allowing them to judge distance. This is fairly common in arboreal animals, as it lets them judge the distance between branches when climbing. The other subfamily is Lorinae, sometimes called Larissinae, which contains the lorises. Like the other closely related primates, they are arboreal and nocturnal, but unlike them, they are not African. Instead, they are found in India, Sri Lanka, and Southeast Asia. Another difference between lorises and galagos is that lorises do not jump, instead preferring to climb between different branches. 
One easily noticed feature to distinguish them from other primates is the dark fur around their large eyes that sharply contrasts with the lighter colours of the rest of their face. While they are mostly insectivorous, some species will supplement this diet with birds' eggs, small invertebrates, fruits, gums, leaves and slugs. It used to be believed that all lorises move very slowly, with a very methodical method of climbing. While this does appear to be true for some species, more recently others have been observed moving much more quickly than was previously thought. However, all species will freeze when they spot a predator. This method of predator defence is only effective as they are concealed by the dense forests in which they live. There are three genera in Laurinae. The first is Loris, which contains the slender lorises. There are only two species of these, the grey slender loris and the red slender loris. As the name suggests, they are distinguished from the other lorises by having a more slender build with thin elongated limbs. There are other subtle differences as well, such as their muzzle being more pointed and having larger eyes and ears. The taxonomy of slender lorises has been disputed for some time. In the early 20th century, the slender lorises were thought to have three, four or even more separate species. Osman Hill, in 1953, placed them firmly as a single species with six different subspecies. The research conducted on this group was all done on captive species, with only one paper published before the 1990s with research on wild lorises. The current understanding of two species was first published by Colin Groves in 1998. The existence of two species was later confirmed with genetic testing. One effect of this taxonomic confusion is that it means that little is known about either slender loris. This is because it is impossible in most cases to work out which species historical studies were researching. Since most of this research was done on captive individuals, it is also less reliable than studying their behaviour in the wild. Many more studies were conducted in the 21st century, but compared to most primates, relatively little is still known about them. The grey slender loris, Loris lidocarianus, is the more common of the slender lorises, but is still considered near threatened by the IUCN. It is found in India and Sri Lanka, in the tropical and subtropical forests in the area, with no apparent preference between the wet rainforests, dry forests, or the montane cloud forests. It used to be divided into four different subspecies, but in 2020, Nijman et al. used genetics to determine that there was not enough evidence to support the existence of these subspecies, so they are now all considered the same. I mention this mainly because the different subspecies are still commonly mentioned online, and the IUCN Red List even has separate pages for some of them. Following on from the research of Nijman et al., such distinctions are arbitrary and do not represent distinct populations of the grey slender loris. They are nocturnal and emerge from their roosts and tree cavities to forage at dusk. They are mostly solitary, as they forage alone, but will roost in family groups of up to seven. Insects are their preferred food, but they will supplement this with fruits, flowers and small vertebrates like mice and geckos. Males have larger home ranges than the females, and are more aggressive with other males that are not in their sleeping area. Females rarely meet other lorises, so have little interaction with them outside of mothers and daughters that roost together. Interestingly, it is the males that tend to the infants during the day. They can communicate with a range of noises, scent marking, and can also use visual signalling up to 20 metres away. Lorises are promiscuous, with males competing to breed a single female. They have two breeding seasons in a year, usually April to June and then October to December. Despite this, females can only breed once in a year. Gestation lasts for five and a half months, and they frequently have two offspring at a time. This is a fairly slow breeding strategy for small primates, with grey slender lorises having the lowest reproductive rate for any primate that weighs less than 500 grams. I mentioned earlier that it is considered near threatened. This has been increased from the previous time it was assessed in 2008, when it was classified as least concern. This increased threat rating is due to the numerous threats it is facing in its native habitat, largely due to habitat loss from deforestation, as well as hunting by humans. Its total population is suspected to have declined between 20-25% to over their last few generations. The other species of slender loris is Loris tardigradus, or the red slender loris. It is endemic to Sri Lanka, only being found in the southwestern part of the country. 
It is rarer than the other slender loris, being classified as endangered, with only around 2,000 to 2,250 individuals left in the wild. This is almost exclusively due to deforestation, as Sri Lanka has lost 97% of its forest cover. In 2003, it was thought that the population of red slender lorises has declined by 80% over the last 200 years. In addition to deforestation, they are also sometimes hunted or trapped for their supposed use in traditional medicines to cure various eye ailments. They are also sometimes caught for sale in the pet trade, but we will look at this more extensively with some of the other loris species. Red slender lorises have reddish brown fur on their back, from which they get their common name, while their underside is a smoky whitish grey. It is a tiny primate, getting to lengths of 18 to 25 centimetres or 7 to 10 inches, and it weighs 85 to 370 grams or 3 to 13 ounces. Its face has darker colours around the eyes, like all lorises, but also has a notable white stripe down the centre of its face. Its movements differ from the grey slender loris, as it moves much more rapidly in trees. It also prefers lowland tropical rainforests, unlike the more general habitat of the grey slender loris. Red slender lorises are also much more social, and are in fact one of the most social of the nocturnal primates. It forms small social groups, containing both sexes as well as young. During the day they sleep in these groups on tree branches. They will also socialise, perform mutual grooming and play wrestle. At night they still hunt individually. Red slender lorises are mostly insectivorous, but will also eat eggs, berries, leaves, buds and occasionally small vertebrates like geckos and other lizards. They will consume their prey whole, including bones and scales, allowing them to maximise their intake of protein. Interestingly, the plant they eat most often is Humboldtia laurifolia, a species only found in Sri Lanka and the Indian state of Kerala. What is interesting about this is that this species is known to have a mutualistic relationship with ants, giving the lorises an easy source of both plant matter and insect prey. Females are dominant in red slender loris groups. Like with the grey slender loris, they can mate twice a year. They mate hanging upside down from branches and, in captivity, will not mate at all if no suitable branch is available. Females give birth to one to two young, which feed from her for six to seven months. Now that we've covered both of the slender lorises, let us move on to the clade containing the remaining two genera. One thing that differentiates them from the slender lorises is that some species are proven to be venomous. These are one of the very few mammals with venom, alongside the platypus and some species of shrew. Given their turbulent taxonomic history, it is hard to tell which species are venomous and if any are not, but I could not find any record of venom in the slender lorises we have been looking at, so it does seem to be restricted to this clade. At least three of these species are confirmed venomous, but it is likely that the others are as well. Since venom has been shown in the pygmy slow loris, which is the most distantly related species of this clade, it strongly suggests that all of this group should have venom, unless it has been subsequently lost in some species. Slow loris venom strongly resembles the protein found in cat saliva that causes allergies in some humans. This venom is inactive in its natural state, but becomes dangerous when it is combined with oil they secrete from glands on their arms. Their defensive posture involves raising their arms above the head, which brings the oil gland near to their mouth so they can quickly activate the venom if they need it. This means that they have one of the only two-step venom delivery systems known in any animal, as opposed to snakes, scorpions, or even the platypus that have fangs, stingers, or spurs to deliver the venom quickly and efficiently in one step. This makes slow loris venom extremely unique and likely not comparable to other venomous animals. This venom is deadly to the small vertebrates they occasionally eat, but in humans and other larger mammals, the bite is intensely painful, takes a long time to heal, and leaves the victim with severe scarring and loss of fur. In extreme cases, it can cause an allergic reaction, leading to anaphylaxis and death. Slow lorises are also known for having a tooth structure known as a tooth comb. While the structure is believed to be useful for both feeding and grooming, it has been pointed out that it is also a highly effective venom delivery system. It has grooves in the comb that allow the venomous liquid to flow through it and out of their mouth. Despite being an effective defence, this venom seems to have evolved for use in disputes with other slow lorises and also against parasites. Several studies looking at slow loris venom have come up with a surprising reason for the evolution of venom. They appear to be mimicking snakes, 
or more specifically the spectacled cobra. As you can see from these pictures, the black stripe on the Javan slow loris looks extremely like the back of a spectacled cobra when seen from above, while the facial markings of the Bengal slow loris look similar to those on a cobra's hood. However, the similarities go well beyond similar markings. I mentioned their defensive pose earlier where they put their arms above their head. Notably, while they do this, they also hiss. Both the posture and the hissing are reminiscent of a snake about to strike. Slow lorises even have more vertebrae in their spine than other mammals, and so perform snake-like movements. In addition to their venom, these behaviours, along with their physical appearance, makes their similarities to snakes too great to ignore, strongly suggesting that they have evolved to mimic cobras, possibly to deter predators. Moving on to look at the remaining species. The first one is the only member of its genus. This is Xanthonectocebus pygmaeus, or the pygmy slow loris. Like all slow lorises, it was originally considered a subspecies of the slow loris. It was elevated to its own species in 1998, but was not placed in its own genus until 2022. As you might expect given their name, they are very small for a primate, only growing to around 19 to 23 centimetres, or 7.5 to 9 inches. They typically forage alone, but can be found in groups of up to four. They feed on tree sap and gum, fruit, invertebrates, flowers, fungi, bamboo, and occasionally small vertebrates like lizards and bats. Males share a range with one or two females and their offspring. Male ranges can be up to 24 hectares, while female ranges can be up to 12 hectares. They will sleep among thick vegetation high in the tree canopy, at least 8.5 or 28 feet above the ground. Pygmy slow lorises give birth to two offspring at a time, generally giving birth during the winter. Pygmy slow lorises are endangered and are found in Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos and southern China. It is threatened due to deforestation but can live in a variety of forest types, including evergreen and semi-evergreen forests, secondary forests and bamboo thickets. It is also heavily threatened for its use in traditional medicines and the pet trade. I guess this is as good a spot as any to look at the slow loris pet trade, since the pygmy slow loris is believed to be the most common species kept as a pet. This is a terrible practice, quite aside from the impact on the already severely endangered wild slow loris populations. As you will now know from watching this video, slow lorises are venomous. While you might think that this would make it a less than ideal pet, the solution is quite simple. When caught, their teeth are cut out using nail clippers, wire cutters or pliers. This is done without anaesthetic, so the animals are in a lot of pain and many die during the procedure from infection, blood loss or quite possibly shock. They are then transported to markets in overcrowded and poorly ventilated cages. It is estimated around 30-90% to 90 die when being transported. Often, rescued lorises are found in cages alongside lorises that have died during transportation. And if you think, well, at least once they are bought at the market, they'll be okay, then there is some more bad news coming. Most people do not know how to look after a slow loris. It is bought as a pet because it is cute, and they have no understanding of what it requires or what its behaviours are. They are often kept in brightly lit rooms, which is incredibly painful for a nocturnal animal. There are videos online of people tickling slow lorises. In the video it is raising its arms, which leads people to believe it is enjoying this treatment. If you have been paying attention however, you will know that a slow loris raising its arms is a defensive posture so it can access its venom. Of course, with its teeth missing it can't bite to defend itself, but this behaviour still shows that the poor loris is terrified, while humans are interpreting it as being cute. While I don't normally do this, I will leave a link in the description to the International Animal Rescue, an organisation that rescues, rehabilitates and releases hundreds of slow lorises every year. It sometimes does not feel that there is a lot we can do, aside from not buying a slow loris ourselves, but donating to organisations like this can go a long way. Just to be clear, I have not been paid to promote them, but when dealing with topics like this, I think mentioning organisations like the International Animal Rescue is the ethically responsible thing to do. Moving on from the grim reality that is the illegal pet trade, all remaining lorises are in the genus Nectocebus, colloquially known as the slow lorises. This is by far the largest genus, with eight different living species. As I have already mentioned, all of the species currently recognised, along with the pygmy slow loris, used to be considered a single species with many subspecies. 
This was separated out into different species in the 1990s, and was confirmed with genetic analyses more recently. I will not mention this with the individual species below since it applies to all of them, but it does make it hard to know which species older studies were looking at, so many of these species have little known about them. Slow lorises are stockier than their slender cousins, with shorter limbs, flatter faces, and smaller eyes and ears. The phylogeny of Nyctocebus is a mess, so I am using a simplified phylogeny that I've taken from Nijman et al. in 2020, who used extensive genetic testing to create it. It was the most recent and reliable one I could find, but note that various online sources will disagree about the exact relationships between these species, or even if some of them should be species at all. There is only one known extinct loris, and it has been tentatively placed in this genus. This is Nyctocebus lingalom, which lived in Thailand during the Miocene about 18 million years ago. It is only known from a single tooth, so there are not enough fossils to say for sure that it belongs in this genus. The species name, Linglom, is the Thai word for loris. The first living species in this genus is Nyctocebus javanicus, or the Javan slow loris. It is critically endangered, and is endemic to the western and central parts of the island of Java in Indonesia. It is quite distinctive due to the diamond shape on its head, with the white stripe between the ears and forks towards the eyes and ears. It is less insectivorous than most lorises, preferring to eat fruit, tree gum, lizards and eggs. They are nocturnal and arboreal, and seem to prefer climbing on vines and lianas. It moves through the canopy, preferring heights of 3 to 22 metres above the ground, or 9 to 72 feet. However, it will go onto the ground to cross open areas of disturbed habitat. There are two forms of the Javan loris, although their exact taxonomic status is unclear. As such, they are not officially labelled as subspecies at the moment, but they do look noticeably different. One, sometimes called the ornatus morphotype, has fur that is longer, averaging 26.8 mm, compared to 22 mm for the Javanicus morphotype. There are other subtle differences as well, but again, it is not clear if these are sufficiently different to denote them as subspecies. Next, we will look at the Cayenne River slow loris, Nyctocebus cayam. It was elevated to the level of its own species more recently than the others, only becoming separated from the Bornean slow loris in 2013. It is found in the northern and central highlands of the island of Borneo. Unsurprisingly, it was named after the Cayenne River, which runs through its territory. It is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. They are distinguished from all other slow lorises, aside from the Bornean slow loris, by their teeth. These species are both missing their second upper incisor. It can be told apart from all other Bornean slow lorises by its facial markings. For example, the darkened fur around its eyes is either rounded or pointed, but much more importantly, is very distinct from the lighter fur on the rest of its face. In other Bornean species, this feature gradually blends into the surrounding fur, making it a less distinctive feature. The Cayenne River slow loris has the big toe on their feet opposing their other toes, allowing them to grip branches more firmly. Its second toe on its hind foot is curved, while all the others are flat. This curved one is used for scratching and grooming. It eats insects, tree gum, nectar and fruit. The next three species I have listed as a polytomy. This is where it is difficult to separate out closely related species to determine which are the most closely related. Since it is unknown, instead of guessing, I have listed them all as being separated from each other at the same time, hence the polytomy. The first in the polytomy is the Philippine slow loris, Nyctocebus menagensis. It is found throughout Borneo, but mostly along the northern and eastern coastlines and some smaller surrounding islands. It is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. Despite having a reasonably large range, it is believed to be very rare throughout it. While historic studies suggested that it was common, this is disputed partly due to the taxonomic confusion of all lorises, but also as those studies based their findings on second-hand reports and not direct sightings or captures. Even if those studies do paint an accurate picture of Philippine slow loris populations at their time, then the population has plummeted since. Studies in the 2000s found a very different reality, finding anywhere from 0.38 animals per kilometre to as low as 0.12 animals per kilometre, which are extremely low numbers. Taking the lowest estimate of 0.12 animals per kilometre, you would only be likely to find a single loris if you extensively searched 10 kilometres of forest. Philippine slow lorises seem to be tolerant to disturbed habitats. They are nocturnal and arboreal, and are social, often being found in groups feeding at the same tree. 
they eat insects, sap, and small vertebrates, only rarely eating fruit. One male generally breeds with multiple females, and their home range is around 9 hectares. Females give birth to one offspring each year and care for them for up to two years before they leave to find their own territory. Philippine sly lorises regularly sleep in dense foliage, but have many sleeping areas throughout their home range, so will only reuse each a few times. The Banga slow loris, or Nyctocebus bancanus, is endemic to Banga Island, which is just offshore of Sumatra. It is rated as critically endangered by the IUCN, but this comes with the notable caveat that it was last seen in 1937, so is possibly extinct. More surveys are required to officially declare it extinct, but it is likely that if any remain, they are highly fragmented, and their population will have decreased by over 80% over the last three generations. This is due to the mass conversion of Banker Island into palm oil plantations, causing a massive loss of habitable area for the species in their native range. Given that information about the species, it is probably not surprising to learn that little else is known about it. Like the other species of slow loris, it was originally considered the same species as all the others. Museum specimens and photographs were studied to differentiate it from the Philippine slow loris in 2013, raising it to the level of its own species. It is assumed to have similar traits to closely related species, such as a venomous bite or eating insects, sap and lizards. The Bornean slow loris, or Nyctocebus borneanus, is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. It is endemic to southwestern Borneo. It is fairly tolerant of disturbed environments, but Borneo has lost a third of its forests in the last 25 years, so this cannot be helping them to increase their population. The other main threat is the pet trade, as we have already discussed. This is another species that has been poorly studied, with only one study estimating their population in 2011 as only 0.05 animals per hectare, which puts them in an even worse position than the Philippine slow loris was, and given their smaller range, this is not a great sign. I should mention that the study was before they were recognised as a different species to the Philippine slow loris, but it is assumed they were looking for the Bornean slow loris, given the area they were searching. The only mention of the species that I could find in the literature after their elevation to their own species in 2013 was a study published in 2021. This study detailed a Bornean orangutan catching and eating a Bornean slow loris, and it was much more focused on the orangutan than it was on the loris. Even if I missed a couple of papers when searching, that is still not a great record that, of the top three papers about them, one is their discovery and one isn't even about them. Most of the other facts I could find on the internet about them were detailing the same things that seem to be true of all slow lorises. So I will move on to the next species, which is in the final clade of slow lorises. The Bengal slow loris, Nectocebus bengalensis, is also sometimes called the northern slow loris. It is the largest species of loris, reaching lengths of 26 to 38 centimetres, or 10 to 15 inches, and weighing 1 to 2.1 kilograms, or 2.2 to 4.6 pounds. It has a round face with large eyes and thick woolly fur. It has venom, but the chemical structure of this is quite different to those found in other lorises. It is hypothesized that this venom is used to communicate information to other Bengal slow lorises, such as their age, gender and social status. The Bengal slow loris is an important seed disperser throughout its range, and is also an important prey item for several carnivores. It frequently engages in a behaviour that all slow lorises do to some extent, but I have glossed over it so far as it is a minor part of their diet for most species. However, it is a key component of the Bengal slow loris' diet. This is feeding on tree exudates. In its broadest sense, exudates is the fluid that leaks out of a wound. In the case of trees, this will take the form of sap, gums, resin and latex, all foods that are high in carbohydrates. Despite not having sharpened claws, the Bengal slow loris will scrape at the plant, breaking its surface or gouging holes in tree bark. The slow loris will then eat the sap or gum that leaks out of the hole it has made. This is almost all they eat during the winter, as it is the most abundant food at that time. For the rest of the year, it will supplement this with fruit, insects, snails, small birds and lizards. It is endangered, but has the largest range of all slow loris species, being found in Bangladesh, India, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand and southern China. Its endangered rating is for the same reason as the other slow loris species, habitat loss, the pet trade and their use in traditional medicines. Along with the pygmy slow loris, they are one of the most common lorises found in markets. 
Fingal slow lorises are most frequently used in traditional medicines to help women after childbirth, but they are also sometimes used to treat stomach aches, broken bones and sexually transmitted diseases. Because of these pressures, it is now extirpated in regions where it used to be common. Despite also occurring in protected areas throughout their range, this does not protect them from illegal logging and poaching or from the increased fragmentation of their habitat. The Sumatran slow loris, Nectar Cebus hilleri, as its name suggests, is only found on Sumatra, although it is restricted to the northern part of the island. It is endangered, and for the reasons you are expecting. It is believed that there has been a 50% reduction in its population over the last three generations due to extensive deforestation on Sumatra and how common it is in the pet trade. It is hard to estimate their abundance in the wild. One survey in 2007 found a very low abundance of 0.39 per kilometre, but when locals were questioned they revealed that there were many captured for the pet trade just before the survey was performed, explaining the low density observed. Few other surveys have attempted to measure their abundance. It has been seen catching insects and eating fruit, but it is generally assumed its diet also contains the staple seen in other slow loris diets, exudates, nectar and occasional small vertebrates. This assumption is supported by the morphology of the head and teeth, but is not confirmed behaviour seen in the wild. They are found in both lowland and montane forests, and in primary rainforests as well as selectively logged forests, suggesting that they can cope with some level of human disturbance. The final species is the Sunda slow loris, or the greater slow loris, Nectasebus kukang. This is the species that all slow lorises were originally categorised as. While this means that its scientific name appears more often than others in scientific studies, it is impossible to be sure that it refers to this species. The Sunda slow loris is endangered, and is found in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Singapore. It is only found in lowland forests, and like the other lorises, is threatened by deforestation in the pet trade. One thing that does not seem to be mentioned with other species is an aversion to being active during strong moonlight. Its home range varies between 2 to 15 hectares, and this seems to depend on the forest type they are inhabiting, with smaller ranges in primary rainforest. In the wild, it is believed that social contact is uncommon, but in captivity, they can be kept together and do demonstrate some social behaviours, such as vocal calls that are unique between individuals. Exudates like sap and gum make up 43% of their diet, but the remainder consists of vertebrates, fruit, leaves and bird eggs. I hope you enjoyed this video. Lorises are extremely cute primates that are extremely unique given that they are the only ones with venom. Unfortunately, they are also highly endangered. They are in danger from habitat loss due to deforestation and poaching due to traditional medicines in the pet trade. If these practices continue, it is likely that they won't be around for much longer. Thank you for listening and feel free to suggest another group of animals you want to see me cover in the comments.